chatting up and always get refined. It's time in the kitchen and party. Welcome, welcome to the evening show with Jackie Brambles. It's the home of great conversations with your favorite artists of the 70s, 80s and 90s. Our opening track, You'll Always Find Me in the Kitchen at Parties, was a hit for our special guest back in 1980. And just a few months after that, his next hit would become that finest of annual traditions, a British Christmas song. Stop the Cavalry first got to number three in 1980. And 43 years later, it still gets played every single year at this time. So we're delighted to welcome to the great conversation tonight, festive favourite Jonah Louie. Hi, Jackie. How's it going? Yeah, pretty good. And yourself? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. It, it's lovely to speak to you. I feel like I'm speaking to a Christmas legend. Oh, um, well, thank you very much. <laughs> it's uh, very kind of you to say that. Well, the, the stats on um, Stop the Cavalry are in, are incredible. Is it um, that the plays of the track jump to 2,332% 2, during November and December, which on average is 24 times more than the rest of the year? And I mean, it's... And it's just become one of those British traditions, you know, for decades now. Well, it is amazing. It's just kind of lucky. It's sort of seasonal, really, because of Christmas, you know. And it, therefore, the, the those statistics build up over time. And uh, let, well, let, tell me the story of how this song came about first, and then we'll backtrack a little bit and, and sort of take off from the, from the beginning of your career. Um, well, I suppose in terms of the melody and the lyric... It, it started off with a, a melody, really, and, and when the the whole of the melody thing was finished, I, I started thinking about the lyric, and I thought, um, "Can you end the gallantry?" And then I changed gallantry to um, to cavalry, you know, made it like the eternal soldier, the flame underneath the Arc de Triomphe commemorates the eternal soldier who eternally dies one generation after the other. So the lyric kind of, you know, dances about to different war scenarios, uh, mainly the Great War trench trench war thing, you know, but also I mention um, nuclear fallout zones to in- imply the suggestion of nuclear war. And all these things, not, not what you would immediately associate with Christmas. Well, that's right, because they weren't. But then... Never intended to be a Christmas song. Well, it's just that I, I thought then that on Christmas Day... Um, it must be awful to be still fighting uh, a war. And there, there was, of course, that momentary armistice or peaceful game of football that occurred between um, the Germans and the British, was it? Or the Allies? Yeah. In, in the Great War. And after the game of football was over, they went back to their trench positions and started fighting each other again. And I thought, how absurd. And then I thought, well, Christmas Day... How nice to be at home for Christmas instead of being yeah. out there cold and hungry. Yeah. You know, all these things are the same thing over the last thousand, two thousand years or whatever. And, and, um, and on it goes, you know, it was released in November 1980 and it was kind of lucky. It was kind of finished in October and the record company wanted me to get it finished. And I always take a long time to finish anything I record. And then they, they saw perhaps saw an angle. Uh, that it could tie in with Christmas because, you know, Christmas was coming up and it was November and so on and so forth. And there was a line in it, you know, wish I was at home at Christmas. Um, but the irony is that um, it did get to number one in France, for example, in July. So it wasn't necessarily a Christmas um, song in every country. Ah, right. But, but it was tied in with the Christmas very much over here anyway. How do you feel about um, having sort of a, a, a Christmas classic? I mean, obviously, from a royalty point of view, it's delightful. Um, and, and but sort of having the emphasis on one song when you've obviously been in the music business a long time is it something of an albatross, or do you, or are you just delighted that your music's always played every year? Well, it sort of blows my mind. You know, sometimes I I might be in a shop, you know, or at, at Christmas time and. And it dawns on me that they're halfway through the track, uh, playing it at the, in the shop. And then I'm kind of looking at myself 
listening to myself in Selfridges <laughs> or something. And it, it's just a weird feeling, you know. Well, perhaps a bit less weird. Let's get you to pick a favourite Christmas tune that's not your own. Uh, what would that be? An Elvis Presley one called Santa Claus is Back in Town. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's a, that's a standout because it's so different from other most other Christmas tracks. Christmas, Christmas. More of a bluesy Christmas than a white one from Elvis Presley with Santa Claus is Back in Town, released in 1965, as chosen by tonight's special guest, who knows a thing or two about Christmas hit songs. Jonah Louie of Stop the Cavalry fame is here, and we'll be back with more great conversation from Jonah next. Welcome back to the Evening Show with Jackie Brambles and to our great conversation where it's just you, me and our special guest, Jonah Louie, who has stopped the cavalry long enough to sit down for a good natter with us to explore his musical memories. Uh, let's kick things off by asking if you recall the very first record you bought for yourself. It's difficult to say. I mean, the, the, the first record I remember distinctly buying was in 1958 yeah. called Good Golly Miss Molly by Little Richard. Good Golly Miss Molly! It's such such a classic piece of singing when it comes in, and it's such a classic boogie. You know, the the whole band are doing this amazing boogie, and uh, um, and I just fell apart when I heard it. Still very short, so I was very very young, and um, I managed to go out and buy it. But the first record I got was for my tenth birthday, I think, and it was the Bill Haley track. Oh wow! <laughs> called Don't Not the Rock, which was a bit of, bit of a funny one, bit of a. But they had twangs of stuff, you know, but my grandmother bought it for me. Don't knock the rock, don't knock the rock, don't knock the rock, rock and roll, that's all. And then as you became sort of a, a stroppy teenager, perhaps you weren't a stroppy teenager, perhaps you are a very pleasant teenager, um, What? how did your musical tastes change then? Who would be sort of, t- you know, the, the, the ones that you really loved at that point? Well, I'm sure I had my moments of stroppiness. Um... <laughs> Well, I, I went to, um, I went on from, from, you know, those, those 50s things. Yeah. To be honest, I went backwards oh. because I found the, the English scene very inadequate, you know. And apart from uh, the first Cliff Richard track, I found all the British stuff really tame. And, and so I went backwards into like blues music of the 20s and 30s and missed out an awful lot until 63 or 4 came along right. with things like the Pinks uh-huh. and the Who. And um, the music scene over here started to liven up. And, of course, the Beatles and the Stones were, were magical and hit great peaks. And so I was rescued from digging back into the past yeah. and became more contemporary again in my taste. Satisfaction, a hit for the Stones in 1965. Tonight's special guest, Jonah Louie was a fan, although, as you said, you were also listening to the same kind of music as the Stones and, and a lot of British artists at that time who were being inspired by the Delta Blues of the southern states from the 1930s. And ironically, the, the British started to do things. They influenced the, the Americans. And the British were, had got it all from the blues. And America wasn't even aware of the blues, white America, uh, until... The, the Brits gave them gave it back we to them. Brought it back with the British invasion. <laughs> yeah, things like, you know, um, Led Zeppelin and, you know, um, it, they loved Robert Johnson and things like that. And they went and they became the number one specials in America. They had five number one albums in the American Hot 100. And just by giving them the blues back to the, that country. That's amazing. Do you remember the first gig you went to of note? You know, not a school band or anything, but one that, you know, of somebody we would know. Yeah, I think so. 69, I went to um, see, hear The Who. Oh. And I think the small faces were on the same. Oh, my goodness. What a bill. Tell you why. It's all to you. It's all too beautiful. The small faces were on. And then The Who came on. And The Who were about 10 times louder. <laughs> and, of course, they stopped using A30s, amplifier 30s. And they, they started using the... The very you know, far bigger amps, and that's how they that, that was part of why they became so big yeah, because they literally blew so everybody loud. away. <laughs> but you know, yeah, they blew everybody away with noise. <laughs> but the Who were a great band. I mean, some of their tracks, you know, 
uh, that that beautiful one that that Pete Townsend did on a an early computer. Barbara O'Reilly, that's fantastic. Baba O'Reilly, The Who from 1971. So you you saw The Who live. Was that was that sort of important? Was it pivotal in making you decide, right, I want a piece of this action. I I, I want to get up I want to get up there and do that. Not not particularly. I, I it's just that it happened to be a, a live gig that I was at. Uh, and and I didn't really ever go to gigs. I, I was pretty much like studying for my A levels and stuff and and then went to college and that, you know, and I, I just picked up on the local the local scene in London. Yeah. You know, I went to folk clubs and blues clubs. Yeah, you know, I I went to the folk club foot um in Grease Street, just round the corner from here, Lake Cousins, Lake Cousin, and Jackson C. Frank and Bert Yance and John Rembo and all these people. Right. Uh, I was sort of just going to live music quite a lot, but not big festivals. But that was the first big festival I went to. But I, I've been to very few big festivals, to be honest. So was there sort of a? Well, I mean, I understand, that especially as you say, around London, there was this sort of pub circuit where many of the bands that we, you know, went on to become very well known. That's where they, you know, paid their dues, learned their craft. Who who would have been in and around there then with you? I mean, I, I saw ACDC in one of the pubs, Red Cow. Wow. In Hammersmith. And and I, I just stopped the car on my way home from somewhere else and thought I'd just pop in and have a look because they sometimes had interesting bands. And, and I couldn't get to the front. I always like to go to the front. And I managed to get to the front. I thought, Christ, this guy's wearing short trousers, <laughs> you know. And it was ACDC. About a year later, they were number one in America, you know. ACDC, you shook me all night from 1980. Can you imagine how loud they would have been in a pub? Uh, well, tonight's special guest, Jonah Louie, lived to tell the tale, and we'll be back with more stories and meaningful musical memories as we continue our great conversation next. Welcome back to the Evening Show with Jackie Brambles. This is the home of great conversations where every night at eight, we have a special guest come in and share their musical memories, plotting their love of music from childhood to the charts. Jonah Louie, best known for his classic Christmas hit, Stop the Cavalry, is with us tonight. So, Jonah, once you started out on your musical career and things started to happen, what contemporaries would you have encountered back then? Oh, well, I was on the bill with Slade a few times doing the university circuit oh, right. before they, they'd stuck it big, and T-Rex. Oh, wow. Um, I remember seeing T-Rex in Amsterdam, and you couldn't cut the cut the atmosphere with a knife. It was so thick with marijuana, you know? Is that right? And, and this was in the days of Tyrannosaurus. Wow. And um, and, and it was great. It was, a, it was a great period, actually. And would you get to hang out much at these gigs and, and get to know the other artists? There was not much mishmashing. And that's a, a rather romantic view of it, really. Uh, you know, we all just kept out to ourselves. Right. Except, except at the Blue Boar, which was a, a famous um, service station coming down the M1. Oh, right. From, from the north to London. And you'd always meet musos in the Blue, blue Boar at three in the morning <laughs> on the way back from their northern gig back to London. <laughs> Any Anyone's you can particularly remember? Over, we, so I do remember hearing the Slade and, and they were far louder than what we were that night and and i was saying to the guys hey we got to get heavier equipment and 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 be better than what we are because i thought <laughs> you know they were a better band than what we were From 1971 because i love you that's slade's first big hit and within the year uh, Jonah, you would be having your own number two hit under the pseudonym Terry Dactyl and the Dinosaurs with Seaside Shuffle. And that turned out to be your ticket to your debut appearance on Top of the Pops. What was that experience like? Well, it was sort of a, a bit of a dream, really. Um, I, I sort of thought, Christ, here I am, you know. Uh, and it was, and, and things were going really quite badly at that time. I was thinking of leaving the band. Right. And, um, and then there was a phone call. Uh, Jonathan King had wanted to purchase a record, uh, that I'd released with my band and, um, and could we buy the rights? 
right as it were so he did we, he was allowed to buy the by my record the record company i was with and he bought the rights and about three or four weeks later it was number two in the charts you know because it was promoted so well even though it'd been released a year before and didn't do anything so promotion is so important sometimes absolutely Absolutely. And and so who are you on that Top of the Pops with? I think people like um, David Bowie. And I imagine that kind of would have had a, quite an impact almost immediately. You know, you, you're sort of the next day you're going into a shop or something and someone's going, oh, aren't you that bloke off Top of the Pops I saw last night? What, what was that experience like? It's funny, really. I remember walking uh, through a, a long street going towards Soho, I think. And and I I passed the pub. And well, before getting to the pub, I heard this strains of some, some music. Well, that sounded good, I thought. I got closer to the pub. And when I passed the pub, I realised they were playing the B-side to Seaside Shuffle, oh. which was one of my tracks. So I was actually, it was my singing that I was listening to, <laughs> not realising, Christ, that's, that's me. It's called Born and Shane, the B-side of Seaside Shuffle, which was a track Rod Jonathan King had bought and, and put it to number two in the charts. And so you, you don't realise, you're so inside the, the eye of the storm, you don't realise half of what's going on, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, it's only maybe later that you realise, Christ, I was in there, I was inside it. <laughs> it's a warm Jonah Louie is our special guest tonight, and that track, Seaside Shuffle, was a number two hit for him in 1972 under the name of Terry Dactyl and the Dinosaurs. Uh, well, we're, we're almost out of time, Jonah. We just need you to choose our final track of this great conversation hour. So we're looking for a song that you revisit often because it uplifts or inspires you or is especially meaningful to you. It doesn't have to be your favourite song because that's probably too big an ask, I think. You can, because I have an answer to it. Virginia Plain by Roxy Music. Oh, what did you love about it? Just... Uh, just a great, exciting melody. And, you know, in fact, um, the guy who sang it um, was heavily influenced by Fats Domino, who was my favourite guy growing up as a kid. And um, so there was that link, perhaps, because I always liked Fats Domino so much. Um, he his he was a fan of Fats Domino, as I, I later found to be the case. And it was just I just love the chord changes. So simple from one chord to the other, two chord change. And there was Eno in it doing some great stuff that oh, obviously yeah. at the time I didn't realize. But um, his, his contribution to that track would have been valuable or invaluable. But it was the melody and the singing and just the, the way it was approached. It was really good. Virginia Plain. Number four in 1972, Jonah Louis' favourite song, Roxy Music's Virginia Plain. Jonah, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for the uh, annual stopping of the cavalry, which always heralds the season to be jolly for all of us. Thank you so much, Jackie. You were great. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Jonah Louis, a festive favourite these past 40 years. Not bad, eh? 